Welcome to Politics NY with Sky, Town Supervisor of Town of Southampton, Jay Schneiderman. Hey, Sky, good to see you. It's great to see you. And now people may know you as Town Supervisor, but I know you as a drummer as well. Oh, that's true. Yeah, I've been drumming since I was a kid. You know, I started, uh, I must have been like 10 years old. First started with piano. Um, and my parents used to beg me to practice piano, but I hated it. But they would beg me anyway. And then I switched to drums. Then they begged me to not practice because it was so noisy. And I loved playing so much. I played all the time. And, uh, but anyway, but I've been, I've been playing since I was a kid and I love it. Um, I also, you know, work on writing music as well. So. So yeah, you have multiple talents. You know, I met um, Joe Saladino, the town supervisor of Oyster Bay is also in a band. So I said, why don't you town supervisors get together and have a town supervisor band? That would be cool. Wouldn't it be? Yeah, I would play with them. <laughs> okay, there we go. Got to set it up. You know, so Peter Ranskoyek, the supervisor in East Hampton, he's also a guitar player and sings. Um, there's been a bunch of us musicians who had wow. held the local office. Uh, Josh Horton, who used to be the South Hold supervisor, was a very talented musician, had a really good band. So uh, it's not so unusual. Okay, then we definitely have to get the band back together. <laughs> so, okay, Town of Southampton, you gained a whole bunch of new residents over the last, during the pandemic. So how has it been accommodating everyone? Yeah, it's hard to say how many, um, came and stayed but we definitely got flooded with people during the pandemic you know the census just came out which compares 2010 to 2020 and we had like a 22 percent increase in population Big, really you know uh, i think we went from something like 56 thousand people to almost 70 thousand people so um, big jump in population i don't think that even captured since that was sort of in 20 yeah. April right. 2020, I think it's even higher than that. Um, Cause that, you know, the pandemic was going, still going, but certainly through 21. Um, so, you know, it's been tough actually, because there's been some pros and cons. Obviously the cons are things like traffic. You know, you got a lot more cars on the road. You're gonna have a little bit more crime as you have more people, you're gonna have more garbage to, to process. You're gonna have uh, more building permits, more demands on town services. Um, you know, more people complaining about different things, you know, that's the nature of, uh, you know, being town supervisor. So, uh, but at the same time, I think it really helped. Uh, it wasn't that our population just went up. The people who came tended to be on the more affluent side. Mm -hmm. So we've seen population surge in the past where it was people sort of at the bottom, a lot of, you know, workers who came into the area. The people who came in this time were people who could work from home using their laptops. Um, they tended to be, you know, uh, you know, computer jobs, higher paid jobs. Uh, a lot of them heads of companies and things like that. They had summer homes already here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so these are people who already had, you know, were, could afford a summer home and they moved into their summer homes and that really, help the restaurants out in a big way. The yeah. restaurants might not have survived um, without it, but all of a sudden you had this group of people here who could go out to dinner every night or at least get order out every single night, you know? So um, it helped, and I think it helped some of the local stores as well, so. Really? The a, I mean, there were businesses now that are open year round that hadn't been before the pandemic. Yeah, so I think, Economically, when you have that much money brought into the local economy, you know, and it gets spread around. Yeah. I think some people had their best years ever. And, you know, when people started, you know, some of these people started saying, well, oh, I'm living in the house more. I'd like to renovate the bathroom or right. maybe, maybe I'll, you know, do some new landscaping. So it created all these jobs, you know, and you know, whether it's somebody from ha the house cleaners to the painters to, you know, everything, personal assistance, it created all these, you know, <laughs> it really bolstered the economy a lot more, you know, the massage therapists, whatever it is. And we'll see if people change their voter registration to maybe voting out East as well. Some definitely have. And we've definitely seen that in Southampton Village where there's all, there were hundreds of new registrants. Now that's a pretty small village though to get 
300 or more new voters, that's definitely pandemic related. In terms of politics and government, what do you see for the future of the East End, you know, after the election and as we move forward? Well, like, so I think I'll be here, you know, personally, I have an election pretty soon. I don't have an opponent. So if I can't win, uh, I'm in serious trouble. So, but, <clears throat> you know, I will see, you know, there'll, there'll be other positions that may stay the same, may change. Um, you know, most people who run for office out here, and you, you really don't need there's no prerequisites, not even for supervisor. You know, you can elect anyone you want to. Um, I, you know, happen to have a, you know, a strong administrative background and a strong science background and small business background. And I think people trust me in general to make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis that affect them. But um, usually the voters get it right. They pick people who care and, uh, Somehow we managed to protect what matters most. So we've done a like a really good job protecting the environment, you know, open spaces and trying to improve water quality. And, and we'll continue to do all that. The big issues that are really hard to solve, like traffic is one, because things are so unaffordable out here. Um, and we've created so much labor demand that labor is <clears throat> on the roads trying to get to work traveling, you know, east-west, and our roads, are, it's an old system of roads, really hard to add new roads or widen roads. So um, we've seen a lot more traffic. Mm -hmm. That's that's a hard one to solve. I and mean, we're adding trains so people can get around by trains. Right. We're trying to build affordable housing. You know, we're working on some intersections that maybe we can get traffic moving better. Like we in the mornings now, there's one light in Hampton Bays that we've been able to <clears throat> set to blink. So it just blinks rather than going green to red. And then you have hundreds of cars stop and then it goes green again and they slowly start to move and it goes red again. And by keeping it a blink, you get everybody sort of through. We're doing that really early in the morning. Okay. Um, so we're doing you know everything we can on the traffic side. Uh, and look, a lot more people are, doing things via Zoom, like you and I are having this meeting. I didn't right. make you drive out here to interview me, or you didn't make me drive somewhere to interview you. We've even set it up so that if you want to talk to a building inspector, you could have a Zoom meeting and share documents from the comfort of your home. Um, we're holding lots of meetings via Zoom. And you know that is making it, I think, easier for people, but it also takes cars off the road. But the other tricky issue that I was going to mention, um, hard to solve, is the affordable housing issue. Mm -hmm. Now we need, you know, people are living in basements, people are commuting long distances. You know, we've got to find ways for the people who we depend on to live in this community. Mm -hmm. You know, when you know somebody might not want affordable housing near them, but they sure want somebody to come driving an ambulance when they have a heart attack. Right. And so where is that person going to live who's, you know, the ambulance driver or the EMT in the back of the ambulance who's going to, you know, resuscitate them? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, you know, it's really hard. Um, land is so expensive and construction is so expensive. And it makes it so if I'm going to make a project work in terms of being affordable, I'd have to build too many units in one spot to make it, and then nobody wants it. They don't want apartment buildings everywhere. They don't want it to look like, you know, the suburbs of New York City. They want right. it to be rural, rural and, you know, bucolic, very, uh, you know, they like the open spaces here. So they're concerned about more people. Right. So it's, it's really hard to balance these things out. So I've looked for ways. Um, I created a law that allows for accessory apartments in homes. Okay. Where, they, where they couldn't exist before, as long as they're affordable. You know, you can, most homes can now build an accessory apartment in a garage or a basement or a portion of the house, but it has to be affordable. That's, you can't just do it and have it not, you know, can't be a summer rental. It's gotta be a affordable unit. We have a few apartment complexes that we've built and a few that are um, in the process of getting permitted. So hopefully that they'll move forward. Um, but things become unaffordable faster than we can make things that are affordable. 
in, uh, in, a, in a way we're victims of our own success. We've done such a good job making this an awesome place to live yeah. that the prices have skyrocketed. Everybody yeah. wants to be here and it's a limited supply. And so, you know, we've been successful in preserving that amazing character, uh, community character and quality of life. And, um, but there's a price to that and that's the lack of affordability. I'm a, I like to think of myself as a public servant, mm -hmm. you know, that I'm here to try to build community, to solve problems, to, you know, create a place where everybody is safe and people feel a sense of belonging. And, um, I, I think, you know, I, I like to think that most people are similarly motivated. You usually can't tell the Republicans from the Democrats, honestly, once they're in office, because like who wants low crime? Is that Democrat or Republican? It's everybody wants that. Right. Who wants good parks where you can go for a hike or, you know, play a game of, uh, you know, baseball or something? Everybody wants that, right? They're not, right. they're not Republican or Democrat issues. They're just community issues. An important point, community issues. It's really not about partisan politics. It's about the community. And that's the purpose of this show is to really communicate these candidates and who they are as people. So we're running short on time, but I would love if you could just give us an overview of how you initially got into politics. Sure. Well, I, I don't think when I was younger, I ever would have thought that I would end up being, you know, a town supervisor or running for political office. Um, I, you know, I went to school for science. I majored in chemistry. I remember in a class though once. Uh, chemistry. I didn't know you majored in chemistry. Yeah, I was a chemistry major. So was I. Yeah, and then my master's uh, was in education too. So I wasn't thinking about running for political office. So I do remember a class. I can't remember what the subject was, might have been uh, political science or something. And the teacher said, if you had to pick one person in this class, it was like 30 people to be the leader, you know, who would you pick? And we all like wrote it down on a piece of paper. Yeah. And like, like overwhelmingly they picked me. I never thought of myself as a leader. I picked like, you know, the tall, handsome guy, whatever, you know, <laughs> you know, typical. And, but everybody, you know, and then they had this conversation about like, why do you think Jay would be a good leader or whatever it is? And um, so I never really thought about going into politics. I got involved locally in environmental issues and, you know, and then I decided to run for office and everybody said, you know, you can't win. You're like, you're not part of the establishment. You're not a committee person. You're, you're an outsider. Right, I wasn't supposed to win, and I did everything wrong, which you know, according to the book. Right. And I, I just went out and I talked to like everybody who lived in the town of East Hampton. I knocked on like every door of every voter, you know, and they voted me in, and I beat an incumbent, which like doesn't happen that often. Mm -hmm. And then you know they reelected me, and so I had no idea that this was for me, but I like I love every minute of it. You know what I mean? I really do. I work, I work really hard, but it's always challenging. And, and it's like you mentioned earlier that I'm a drummer. I, I, I tend to be, you know, I like creative things. And you might think government, how that's not creative. Oh my God, it's so creative. It's right. so, like, I'm constantly solving problems. I'm, right. you know, I'm creating new parks. I'm looking at how to better move traffic. You know, I, I like to think outside the box and come up with solutions that other people, it's creative. It really know? is. I see it. You know, my background's in government and lobbying. It's, it's connecting the pieces, making a yeah. puzzle, connecting people, learning about issues. I see it as creative too. Yeah. So I would have never thought I, you know, would be in political office, but, uh, you know, people trust me, they keep voting for me. And, you know, as long as they want me to serve, I, I'll, I'll continue to serve. I'm up against the term limit though. So uh, I got one more term as Southampton supervisor. So I got to start thinking about if I'm going to stay in elected office, what, uh, what direction to go. Ooh, give us a little tidbit. Come on, an exclusive uh, piece of news here. I'll have to stay tuned. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, Town Supervisor Jay Schneiderman for being part of politics and why with Sky. And you will be reelected since you don't have an opponent. I hope so. <laughs> and we'll see you soon. All right, Scott. Good talking to you.